So let me just run through those quickly. Um, first would be if you'd, if you'd be willing to just check your grades a couple times in the next few days, that would be great. Um, if there are things that need correction in the grade book, do let us know. A few things we already know about, so if, 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 the, if what concerns you when you look at your grade book are these things, don't worry about it. Number one is that the first couple weeks of the attendance record was lost, so don't panic if your attendance record looks funny at the, at, for the first few weeks. I think it was the first two or three weeks. Don't worry about it entirely. Uh, the other thing that you shouldn't worry about just yet is that um, th your final number of points is not set yet. Clearly, there are other assignments coming in. But even some of the work that you've done has not been calculated to the scale that it will ultimately. The one thing that I'm thinking of is you've been taking quizzes throughout the semester in class. And I, I need to check the syllabus. I think that's on a 200-point scale. Well, you haven't received. Uh, 200 points for that, there haven't been the opportunity to earn 200 points. So we will take your scores, your raw scores for the in-class quizzes and recalculate them on an appropriate scale, uh, and that's actually 150 points. But I'm sure none of you have even close to 150 points in that because we've probably only taken 15 quizzes at most, well, maybe 20 quizzes at most on five points. Possibly some of you have near 100 points, but none of you will have 150 points. So even if you have a perfect score on your in-class quizzes thus far. So that needs to be rescheduled as well. Otherwise, though, start looking at that grade book. If there are things that need untangling, oh my goodness, uh, um, the Athanasius lectures uh, um, you attended, number one, but it's still not recorded, or if so, you one of your tests is missing or something like that, let us know early so we can get that settled. Your test, your last test, which will cover the last three class periods up through Charlemagne to the, the rest of the material that's covered today. That will become available just as soon as Palmer sends, Palmer Bandy has some time to send out an email to you to let you know when you can take that at the, at the Writing Center. Um, we'll give you at least the week of finals to take that, but probably it'll be released to you even a day or two before that. So wait for that email from Palmer Bandy to know when that last exam experience opens. The Writing Center people sat me down and asked me to uh, uh, ask you to all be punctual with your appointments in the Writing Center. So apparently, and I'm not pointing fingers because I don't know who to point fingers at, but apparently uh, some of you would make appointments and then come in significantly late for those appointments and then expect that you could still stay an hour. Well, you've got to be there for your appointment if you want an hour's time. You've got to be there for the time you signed up. Especially that was problematic when people would come in at, they'd make an appointment for four to five o'clock and then come in at 4.30 and still hope to have an hour's time. But of course, the Writing Center closes at five. So just be, uh, be courteous to those running the Writing Center. We don't want to have to ask them to stay late. And, and they certainly don't have to stay late on our behalf. So uh, they, they can close uh, whenever they need to close. Be mindful of that. Great. Any other housekeeping stuff that we need to get through? Chase, please. Um, well, I made it as far as passing off that responsibility to somebody else. Have they been entered? All right, I'm so sorry that I found the records in my office under a stack of papers. I'm sorry. But there should be no trouble there. We'll just, it's just a matter of getting those names logged. I'm sorry for the slowness there. Any other concerns? Go ahead. Uh, the interviews that, that we farmed out here and there were each worth 10 points. So, yep, the one line in the grade book should be EC interviews, extra credit interviews. And if you had two of those experiences, you should have 20 points, etc. If your numbers aren't right, let me know so that I can get that fixed. Good. It's amazing how many emails actually go to spam. So, and I don't check my spam box all the time. So I apologize if there's been miscommunication. Anything else? Great. <clears throat> let's get it. You can always ask questions, but let's get into the um, topic today. <clears throat> and here's where we're headed. <clears throat> here's a roadmap of where we're going to go. I'd like to talk about the medieval reform movements uh, under the name of monasticism. Medieval monasticism, and I love talking about medieval monasticism. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I do. But to me, it's such a it's such a moment of hope. 
in the Christian church. That uh, we've come through some hard times um, uh, in the history of Christianity this semester. But to me, the medieval monastic reform movements, um, and I call them reform movements because it seems to me that that's what they were, and, and, and I think that's an appropriate name for them, but medieval monasticism is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, it, it's such a moment of hope and, and regeneration, new growth in the church that I'm just, I love talking about this. So we'll, we'll talk about medieval monasticism. And then the second thing that we'll talk about will be, um, hang on. Well, let me restructure this. We're going to talk about Okay, it's all under the guise of medieval monasticism, but if we were going to break it down a little bit more carefully, I'd say this. We'll talk about <clears throat> the Augustinian rule. The Augustinian rule, we'll look at that, and the Benedictine rule. So we're going to look at the principles by which some of these medieval monastic movements operated. And then I'm going to do an overview of some of these uh, uh, monastic movements. The Franciscans, a little on the Dominicans. Um, we'll talk about the Cistercians and so on. So I guess, I guess it's all about monasticism today. Uh, and I, if we have time, we get into medieval exegesis as well. If we have time, George Lucas said that, at least I'm told that George Lucas said that um, films are never really completed. They're just given up on. That'll be the end of our story, too. This class won't really complete. We'll just give up on it. We'll just run out of time. Fortunately, we have the luxury uh, in this class of picking it up next semester, too. But we're trying to cover 2,000 years of history. We'll just end, we'll just end when we need to. But I think we may have time to get to medieval exegesis as well. All right, great. It's the very last period of class, and I am so glad that we get to talk about monasticism in this. We get to end on a positive note. One of the amazing things about uh, church history, at least I find it amazing, is the surprise element in the story. And every good story has some surprises in it, right? You wouldn't want to watch a, uh, a movie or read a novel that that was completely predictable. And I think God finds good stories to be also surprising. And church history, the story of his church, is littered with surprises. Especially, and I'll hear I'm following Kenneth Scott Latourette, the Yale historian of church history, who especially focused in on the, the way that Christianity seems to grow and then regress. It's like this expanding and contracting heartbeat almost. Uh, there, there are gains made in this area, there's growth in this area, and then there's also collapse or challenge or, uh, um, or fragmentation. We've seen this expansion, regression, going uh, 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 rhythm going on in the history of the church. Um, when I teach, I teach a single lecture for the Perspectives class, which is a, a church-based educational initiative on missions that takes place here in Spokane and elsewhere. And every spring they ask me to do a one uh, session class period on the first 1800 years of church history. And when I have to reduce church history to a few sound bites, like for that experience, that's the model that I use to teach church history. There's expansion, there's contraction. We, we see this expansion of Christianity in the first century with the Apostle Paul, and that's uh, immortalized in our canonical New Testament, the, his exploits in uh, Acts and his, his uh, missionary journeys and so on. We see the, the powerful outgoing of the gospel all the way to Rome before the, end of the second, before the end of the first century, shockingly enough. Then what happens in 70 AD? There's this crushing uh, uh, um, blow to Christianity as the, the capital of what was perceived to be the Christian world, this Christian movement, which was then, of course, very tied to Judaism, is lost. Uh, uh, Jews can't even enter uh, Jerusalem after the Bar Kokhba revolt, and, and Rome restyles the city of Jerusalem as Capitolina Aelia. Um, Jerusalem's lost. Then Christianity takes, uh, surprisingly, there's this conversion of Rome, Constantine converts, and of all things, this 
persecuting imperial force becomes a tremendous engine for the expansion of Christianity. Well, marvelous. What happens then? Well, the Roman Empire collapses. Surprise! Is Christianity over? No. Uh, in fact, Christianity only expands beyond the borders of the empire and to new peoples that would have had no other access to this Christian world had power remained exclusively in the hands of the Romans. We find the Christianization of the peoples out beyond the borders of the empire. What happens then? Well, actually, medieval society does very well uh, for a time. Of course, Islam comes and wipes out North African Christianity. Is that the end of the Christian world? No. Actually, things continue to, to, to uh, grow and flourish. Medieval monasticism seems to be another high watermark. This uh, Christendom is about as solidified and stable as it can be. What happens then? Well, we'll actually wait for some of the story for next semester, but the Reformation comes, which is both this tremendous... Uh, um, force of renewal and revival and also leaves this ominous question of disunity and schism over the church. Will the disunity of the church destroy it or ultimately will it spin apart? Um, well, no. Actually, one of the amazing things about the Reformation, and I think that's underestimated, is the fact that when you have so many different churches, all of them understanding themselves to be the true church, um, then your missions, your missions initiative take on a completely new life. World mission actually arises in a way that it had never been seen before in the history of the church, because every church has to reach the entire world. Cumulatively, they do a pretty good sh show at it. There's, there's a, a missions movement that would have surprised us all. Where did that come about? But the missions movement probably could not have happened in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries had not the Reformation happened in the 16th, which left this question mark of disunity over the church. Um, we're at a moment, too, of expansion and gain, as we've seen a, a Christian, the numbers of Christian adherents expand wildly. But now again, the question is, will we completely spin apart? Will Christianity become so diverse that we actually will lose the ability to recognize Christ in one another? So anyway, the story goes on. But you've seen this rhythm throughout the whole story of this uh, uh, expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction of Christianity. Well, as we get to medieval monasticism, realize that we're at a period of radical expansion. We're at a moment where Christendom is doing very well for itself. Thank you very much. There's tremendous power in the church. The church has amazing power over society and the way that life is lived in the Middle Ages. And strangely enough, this actually fuels the monastic reform movement. What is monasticism at its heart? I think it's kind of a back to the Bible movement. It's a longing monastic. What fuels the monastic spirit? Do you remember what fueled the monastic spirit originally? When did we see monasticism pop up on our radars originally? In the fourth century, right? Actually, in the wake of the conversion of Rome, when imperial Christianity was a, a, a new phenomenon. That's when the monastic spirit came and first appears in a significant form, at least in terms of significant numbers. What was monasticism at the first? It was a desire to regain a spiritual fervor that had been perceived to be lost as Christianity becomes this powerful institution, wielding all this civic, uh, civic clout and influence over the greater society. There was a faction of the Christian church that was longing for this uh, perceived, more real version of Christianity that can really only exist under times of oppression, of marginalization. And it was in that context of phenomenal power in Christianity, that the church had phenomenal power, that there was a group of Christians who were longing for the good old days. Let's get back to the time when we were focusing our spiritual energies not on building massive cathedrals, but in seeking God in quiet times of prayer. Let's get back to real spirituality. Let's get back to the monasteries. And I, th I think in the Middle Ages we have that same dynamic going on. It's a time of tremendous power for Christianity uh, and, and influence over society. And it's also a time when monasticism is booming. This, alter, this alternative way of seeking God, not in the glories of cathedrals, um, uh, but in quiet moments of prayer, in stillness.
that's, that's when monasticism is doing very well in the Middle Ages. <coughs> Let me talk to you about the Augustinian rule. How is it that monasticism operates in the Middle Ages? And because, again, I've already apologized to you for the fact that we call it the Middle Ages, but it's really this huge period of time, because we're dealing with such a large period of time, I think the best way to unfold the story of monasticism to you is to take you into the mind of how monastic life actually operated. Because once you understand the sort of the DNA of monastic life in a specific situation, you'll be able to apply that over this very large time period and diverse time period that we call the Middle Ages. So I want us to understand first the Augustinian rule. And when I, when I use the word rule here, I'm talking about, yes, like a manual, uh, like sort of like the LSG, uh, L, L, uh, SLG, thank you, but, uh, but don't let that give you negative connotations. It's a manual for community life, how this life is supposed to work together. Augustine actually never formalized a rule, although the material that I'm going to present to you from one of his letters, letter 211, and then also he talks, he gives us some of what was later formalized as the Augustinian rule in his sermon 355 and 356. This material that I'm going to give you from Augustine was taken and formalized into his rule. Um, we've talked about Augustine earlier in the fifth, fourth and fifth centuries, and you've seen how he did emulate the life of a monk uh, after he lost his mother and his lover, he went back to North Africa and sort of refashioned his family estate as a, a monastery of sorts. Um, and from the life that he lived there and also the exhortations that he gave, a formal rule was created and uh, um, uh, Augustinian monasticism thrived through the Middle Ages and continues to today. You remember, of course, Martin Luther, for us, would have been the most famous Augustinian monk. But there were many, many thousands of other monks through the Middle Ages following this lifestyle. What is it that Augustine gives us? What are the principles that he lays down for how the life of a monk should work? The, let me give you the context for this letter where he spells out these principles that we're going to uh, um, work through and look at that, that later become formalized as the Augustinian rule. This is the context for this, this letter that he writes. His sister, Augustine's sister, had been working as a prioress over a convent of women, and then she was, she basically retired, and some, a new prioress takes over, and the sisters were quite unhappy about this because they really loved Augustine's sister. She must have been a very winsome person and a very good administrator. So she was very loved by the community, and when she had to move on, uh, people were quite upset with that and wanted their old prioress back. And so Augustine is writing to this community of women, trying to settle them and encourage them to continue to pursue this life of uh, communal holiness, despite the fact that they've lost his sister. And of course, Augustine was quite a fan of his sister, thought she was pretty cool too. So here's what he does to set up this discussion. He says, consider how evil a thing it is that at the very time when we rejoice in the return of the Donatists to our unity, so you've been writing quite a bit about those Donatists and was celebrating the fact that they were coming back to the fold. We have to lament internal discord within our monastery. Be steadfast in observing your vows, and you will not desire to change for another the prioress whose care of the monastery has been for so many years unwearied, under whom also you have both increased in numbers and advanced in age, and who has given you the place in her heart which a mother gives to her own children. All of you, when you came to the monastery, found her there, either discharging satisfactorily the duties of assistant to the late holy prioress, my sister, or after her own ascension to that office, giving you a welcome to the sisterhood. When you joined the monastery, wasn't she there handing out cookies and welcoming you? She's, she's, she's a good person. She's done her job well. Under her you spent your novitiate. Under her you took the veil. Under her, your number has been multiplied, and yet you are riotously demanding that she should be replaced by another, whereas if the proposal to put another in her place had come from us, it would have been seemly for you to have mourned over such a proposal. All right. So here Augustine is giving us a, uh, a, a uh, the context for his discussion. He's going to write out, here, sisters, or how you should live. Uh, um, 
And we're going to look at his principles in detail, see if we agree with them, see if we don't, see what spiritual wisdom we might be able to glean with them. And at any rate, depends whatever our analysis of these rules may be, it's a good picture of how medieval monasticism worked. So we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of how these principles actually operated. First of all, as the letter continues, uh, this is a paragraph that I've selected and I want us to look at because it gives us sort of this vision of what monastic life is, right? Monastic life is not, um, is not common sense to everyone. It's a particular spiritual vision. It requires a, a, particular, um, a particular set of goals. What is it that monastic life is about? And here is Augustine's summary of what he believes these women are trying to do. He's trying to relate to them in a, in, in a way that uh, um, praising their, their passion for their pursuit, what it is that they're doing as a community. So what do we think of this? Amid the great offenses with which this world everywhere abounds, I may be comforted at times by thinking of your number, your pure affection, your holy conversation, and the abundant grace of God which is given to you so that you may not, excuse me, so that you not only have renounced matrimony but have chosen to dwell in one accord in fellowship under the same roof, that you may have one soul and one heart in God. Now, this is meant to be a paragraph that as we read, we say, yes, that's capturing my spiritual vision. Why I'm making these sacrifices and why I choose to live in this particular communal form. What is it? Respond and talk with me if you would a little bit. What is it that encompasses this monastic vision? What is the monastic life about? What do you see? Keith. Okay, so yes, it's communal life, and it's and so we talked about the difference between Anchoretic and Cenobitic monasticism. Everything here that has to do with a rule is going to by default be Cenobitic monasticism. The Anchorites didn't have their own rules. It was a community of one. They they operated in communion with God. They didn't need rules. The rules are only necessary when you have groups. So, yes, Keith, good. We're talking about communal life, and the ultimate aim of this is for a communion with God. Good. And I think you can see then why this type of piety would especially flourish in times of suspicion concerning a, quote, mainstream pursuit of God. If, if there is a, um, if there's an, it, sort of a widespread suspicion that the formal church is uh, too, too given over to power, politics, if, it's beca if, the, if the church has become too worldly of an institution, that fuels this type of piety because it's, it's an attempt not through the mainstream church but through an alternate mode to pursue life with God. Good. And it's in community. That's necessarily part of the package. What else do you devise here? Or uh, what else do you see here, Chase? Okay. Good. Now, I see clearly, and I was hoping someone would note, that yes, renunciation of marriage is part of the formula for a monastic life. But, Chase, how did you, how did you deduce that... that Matrimony was only an example of things denounced. Okay, I see your point. That's good. Right. There, there is a renunciation of matrimony. That's part of the formula that makes monastic life work. So we're not dealing with families. Families get protective. Fathers and mothers get terribly protective of their children, and children are usually quite attached to their parents. There's special relationships that form in that context. And that doesn't lend itself for communal life, because you have all of these, these closed systems, right? But uh, uh, the, the monastic life is meant to be an open system. It's a community where, yes, Chase, you're sharing all these things, which allows you to live in simplicity, you can economically, this makes great sense, uh, and then also because you're not married, we trust there's no uh, there's no pre-creation of children going on in these communities either, which means that you don't have little ones to care for. These are very economically stable institutions. Yep. So the two pieces 
that sort of set the stage for this monastic life would be renunciation of marriage and communal life. Good. Chase, you had a comment. <clears throat> right. Good. No, that's a very good question. And one that becomes increasingly interest, uh, interesting, I think, in our own context. Well, good. Um, um, wh when we look back, when I look back, at the church fathers and this first phase of monasticism, it does seem to be that they had sometimes quite embittered views of marriage, very pessimistic views. Um, this was something that was only a concession for human weakness. It's only the only good thing about it. Uh, Jerome is talking about marriage, and he says, really, the only good thing that can come from marriage is the procreation of more virgins. So there, there's this view. There's this very sort of negative view of human sexuality. Um, and at the same time, who am I to, to say that, yeah, I actually won't judge that view of human sexuality. Um, it seems to me that I'm amazed personally how different societies' views of sexuality can be. And it's very easy for us to, to assume that our own view, of human sexuality, well, own view of human sexuality must be the correct view, and everything that differs from that is incorrect. So we look, today we have an incredibly sexualized culture, and we sort of presume that that must be normal and right, and we look back at a society that's very focused on abstinence, and we assume that that must be messed up. Now I'd put a question mark over that. Uh, um, who's to say that that actually isn't the more correct view? However, in any case, we can look back at that ancient view and says, yeah, say it does have a very negative view of human sexuality, and that's largely continued through the Middle Ages as well. Yep. Also, now, to speak positively about it, though, um, part of it is just motivated by necessity. Times were still hard in the Middle Ages, and they've cre these mona monastic communities were incredibly stable economic institutions. They could outpace any other social model competing with it, always, uh, because, because everybody in the work, everybody in the community is a uh, productive member and because they're not caring for children. So, so these engines can always outpace the competition. Good. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Wow, you're asking me to spill all my prejudices at once. <laughs> I, um, it's an interesting footnote. Let's just let's dabble with that just for a moment and see what happens. Um, <clears throat> I'm a very happy man. I I was made to be married, and I'm very glad to be married. But it seems to me that. Um, um, it seems to me that our culture does have a very faulty view of marriage. What's very interesting to me in all the debates that are raging about human sexuality right now is everybody agrees that sexuality is the most important part of your humanity, right? No matter which, what's happening in that debate on human sexuality, particularly around the question of homosexuality, what's very interesting to me is that everybody sort of implicitly agrees that your sexuality is actually what defines you as a person. What? No. Uh, the, the ancient view would have not understood that at all. And, and I think there's something wise about that, sort of putting, putting sexuality as a component of who you are oh, down a few steps. It's maybe the sixth or seventh is important as who you are as a person. Um, and, I, and I think there actually could be a lot of wisdom in that. Our, our evangelical culture, too, our conservative evangelical culture, as we assess questions of sexuality, tend to give them phenomenal importance. And I think part of the reason why there's this massive miscommunication going on culturally about human sexuality is that part of it is that no, human sexuality is actually it's it's been cast far out of proportion in our culture, which is why no one can give it an objective assessment and come up with something reasonable. No one's being very reasonable about this debate. Um, so when I look at the scriptures, 
it's easy for me to superimpose this, this tremendously joyful view of human sexuality onto that. And there are some lovely things that can be read at weddings. There's also a lot of passages that should not be read at weddings. And, and, I, and I think we have not objectively looked at those texts. 1 Corinthians 7 is, is something that, God forbid, we should read at a wedding and ruin the whole time, right? Or, uh, or, or even just looking at the example of the way family life operated in scriptures. I, my Hebrew teacher was talking to me uh, once, and he said, Jonathan, can you think of a single example of a decent father in the Old Testament? No. Well, what is that? Pa part of that is just a depiction of human depravity, that, that we have all of these terrible, uh, uh, perceived to be terrible father figures in the Old Testament. Uh, and part of it is, I think, a legitimately different model of how family life works. Let me spill all of my prejudices. Then, then we'll be over with this and we can start on something else. But I had the opportunity to meet with um, um, uh, Brother Andrew in 2006. Do you, does any of you know the name Brother Andrew? God Smuggler, some of you will remember that. An older generation knew his name quite well. He was a very famous missionary. He started Open Doors, which is a ministry that some of you might know. Anyway, uh, it was 2006. I wrote Brother Andrew and asked if I could come and see him. And um, I took him, my email was lost among his hundred secretaries for a while. But then at some point I got an email from one of his associates said, yeah, Brother Andrew will meet you with you at this time. So I said, yes. I was in Cologne at the time um, at a, at a uh, language school there. So I took a train ride up to Amsterdam where I could meet him. It was outside of Amsterdam that I met him in his home, actually. And uh, the, the, the elderly man very graciously gave me about two hours of his time, and we just chatted, just talked. One of the things that stands out to me as I was talking with him that permanently changed the way that I thought about these type of issues was he, he was very open with me and said something to the effect of, Jonathan, I had a terrible family life. No, the only time I was home was when I was too broken to actually do anything else. And then I'd return home basically because I was too broken down, running about doing these ministry things, smuggling Bibles into the, the uh, Eastern Europe. And I was, a, I was a young man in my early 20s, and this sort of shocked me. I was like, what? Brother Andrew, I thought of you as this great spiritual leader, leader and you're telling me that you were a terrible father? And uh, his response was, well, Jonathan, if your children see you uh, sacrificing for kingdom work, they may follow that example. If they see you actually uh, dedicating all of your energies to the family unit, they'll presume that there's actually nothing to your faith and walk away from it. Now, who knows if he's correct? And, and I, I don't have near the life experience to be able to judge that. But that was a shocking thing for me to hear. Um, and and uh, so all of that to set a question mark about our, over our presumptions about the way family life should work. The monks had a very different view. Do any of you want to return the favor by spilling your prejudices? <laughs> You may if you care to. All right. Then let's look. Thank you for that interaction. I appreciate that. Let's look specifically at the, the rules for how Augustinian life should work. Here, here is what Augustine says about the way life should work. Thanks, thanks for helping me set the stage for this discussion. The rules which we lay down to be observed by you as persons settled into a monastery are these. First of all, here's the first rule, in order to fulfill the end for which you have been gathered into one community, dwell in the house with oneness of spirit and let your hearts and minds be one in God. And call not anything the property of one, but let all things be common property. All right, so I'll take notes on the board. How would you summarize this rule? Augustine's rules. What's the first rule? How would you summarize it? Go, go ahead, Marcus. Good. Sure. The first principle is that this is a communal life. So that 
people don't individually own stuff, but that everything is owned by the community. And I've already alluded to the fact that this is makes for an incredible economic savings. This is better than any coupon that you can get at the store for amount, the amount of money that you'll be saving. Um, I was I was introduced to this. I never actually was close to a real monastic community, but the closest that I got to it was when I was living at Fordham University and once in a while would come over to the Jesuit community building where they did live in community. My doctor father, Joseph T. Leonhardt, once in a while would go out uh, to eat at a restaurant, uh, which I always thoroughly enjoyed. We'd go to some place in Little Italy, which was just across the the um, the avenue there from the university in Little Italy in the Bronx, and we'd go to a restaurant, Tradenois or someplace like that. And when we'd come into the garage to get a car to head out, there was like four cars parked in this garage. To my memory, there may have been a separate garage. I think this whole building lived with a, just a couple cars, and Father Leonhardt would sign out the car that he was taking and then drive it away. You ever thought about how often your car just sits in your parking lot doing nothing? Couldn't that car be put to better use? Well, yes, uh, and hence go cars and other things like that that are actually taking hold in larger cities. But th the point is clear. If you share cleverly your goods, you can live with far less, and the monks put to this to, to very good work. All right, how would you, this is rule two, how would you paraphrase it? And this is two slides, so let me read this quickly. Let them moreover, that's of course the sisters in this convent, let them moreover not hold their heads high because they are associated on terms of equality with persons whom they would not have approached in the outer world. But let them rather live, excuse me, lift their hearts on high and not seek after earthly possessions. Lest, if the rich be made lowly, but the poor puffed up with vanity in our monasteries, these institutions become useful not only, only to the rich, rather, and hurtful to the poor. On the other hand, however, let not those who seem to hold some position in the world regard with contempt their sisters, who in coming into this sacred fellowship have left a condition of poverty. Let them be careful to glorify rather in the fellowship of the poor sisters than in the rank of their wealthy parents. All right. That was a little more complicated, but can any of you deduce a clear principle from that text? Marcus, go ahead. You're on fire. Good. Good. And equality is a word that can mean a whole lot of things in our culture. I think the word is terribly abused. We often don't know what we're talking about when we use the word. But I like what you've got there, Marcus, a, a, a quality in concerning specifically this, this uh, pursuit of humility, right? Augustine says, Augustine says, he, he warns us in the first part of the citation that if the monasteries aren't administered correctly, they could be useful only to the rich. What does he mean by that? And hurtful to the poor. What, what is Augustine afraid could possibly go wrong in this situation? Josh. Yes, and specifically, envision that for me. Good. Ironically, what Augustine here is afraid of is that when the rich enter the monastery and set aside their former life of luxury, that they would exercise humility, but poor sisters coming into this communal living, who perhaps had a very difficult life, would actually be very relieved in these contexts. Oh, finally I've got uh, a stability and, and, a, and a safe place to, to rest and so on, uh, that the poor sisters this would actually be a step up in their, in their uh, social standing. And that these sisters from very wealthy backgrounds, they would be the only ones exercising humility. And for the way that Augustine perceives this situation is that the, the, the Christian life, what's good about these monastic situations and communities, is that people have an, honor, an, an ability to exercise real humility. Now if only the rich are making sacrifices, if, if that... Uh, um, 
is the lifestyle that's praised and rewarded also humanly and by God, then the monasteries are only going to be valuable to those who are taking a step down. The monasteries are only going to be valuable to these sisters who are able to exercise humility. What does Augustine rather want to happen? Yeah, I think you've touched on it. Various of you have touched on it. Right. Augustine wants there to be this essential harmony between the sisters, that, that um, there's not bitterness, you know, bitterness from those who had this, uh, uh, who perceive themselves as doing something more sacrificial than those against the other sisters. There's supposed to be this internal harmony. Good. Any other comments from you? Chase? Right, right. No, g good. The, I, I received that comment. Thanks for underlining that. Good. Yep. All right. Principle number three. How would you paraphrase it? <clears throat> Be regular in prayers at the appointed hours and times. In the oratory, let no one do anything else than the duty for which the place was made and from which it has received its name, so that if any of you having leisure wish to pray at other hours than those appointed, they may not be hindered by others using the place for any other purpose. Hmm. What's Augustine's admonition? Shoot. Yes, and specifically how? Good. So how should I paraphrase that, Keith? Yeah, consistency. Be regular in prayer, both in place and time, for the way that prayer actually operates. Why? Some of you think through that principle. Do you agree with that? Marcus. Yes. Good, Marcus. I, I'm convinced this is extremely important. So let's talk about prayer for a moment. I think in our community, I've been struck, I've been with this community now for uh, four and a half years. I came in the fall of 2010 here at Moody. And as I've uh, worked with a lot of students and other faculty members here and sort of grown into this community, one of the things that's most impressed me about it is the, the spiritual fervor that I perceive. People want to learn theology because they want to do something with it. They actually want to live this. And I'm convinced that the first step to actually learning how to live theology is learning how to pray it. If we can't pray the theology, you're never going to be able to live it in any other sort of practical sense. So I think prayer is actually the, for what we're trying to do and what many of you actually want to accomplish in your theological studies, that orientation, you want to experience God and you want to do theology. All right, step number one is clearly we have to learn to pray. And, and if we can't do that, give up any other aspirations of being practical about your theology. It won't be anything real. Um, so we've, we've, got to, we've got to figure this out a bit. What do you, now, many, of, many of us, and I can only speak for myself here, but we have this, this idea that spontaneous, if prayer is t simply talking to God, that spontaneous prayer must be where it's at. So formalized prayer is something that needs to be avoided. Um, just like you don't, well, yeah. There's there's a there's such an emphasis on spontaneity that we we're a little bit afraid of routine. The ancient wisdom would tell us much the opposite. That actually there's a strength in in disciplining our lives in how to pray. There's a there there are formulas to it. There's a way to be followed. There's there's a regularity in place, in time, in position. It's a skill. What do you think? How do you respond to that? 
Go ahead, please. Yes. Right. It, it works itself into part of the community. What do you say, though, against those who are quite afraid of that model and say, look, it's, if, if it becomes too formalized, it will become rote. You'll miss actually communing with God. It'll just become an exercise. How do you respond to that? Huh. OK. I don't know. Why do we? <laughs> yeah, that's how I would respond. <laughs> OK. OK. Good. Good. So other parts of our Christian experience are structuralized and for the better, perhaps prayer as well. OK. Interesting. Cameron. Sure. Yeah. Good. Good. Thanks, Cameron. Misty. So I'm hearing from you, Misty, and, and also from Cameron, uh, perhaps, just the reality that our lives are built on habit. And so let's just be honest, and realistic about this. Best prayer will also be a, a, a practice, a habit. OK, go ahead. Go ahead. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm very interested by your responses because I wouldn't have expected that. I would have expected many more voices, and maybe those who hold that position are just being quiet today, but I would have expected many to actually resist that and say, no, extemporaneous prayer is the only proper form of prayer. Josh and then Dee Dee. Hmm. Oh, good. Good, Josh. Dee Dee. Hmm. Sure. Sure. Mm hmm. Hmm. It's a very interesting point that I think I can bear out from experience. If we focus too much on the spontaneity of it, then suddenly our prayers are consumed with 
Help! I'm in another an emergency situation. Yeah, good, good, Dee. These are surprising answers to me. Oh, go ahead, please. Yes. Isn't that, isn't that a brilliant part of the instruction, too, here, is that there's actually a specific place for prayer. Um, I, I s experienced this when I was, um, there was a student who used to go here. He's no longer with us. Um, but um, I think the first or second year that I was here, he, th this particular student had a tremendous passion for prayer. And he invited me over to his place to pray with the students in the house. And I was very impressed by but what I witnessed there. Uh, they took me down to the basement, which was, they called it the furnace room. And literally in the furnace room, they had thrown out like rugs and places where you could kneel and pray, put up some funny lightings, and made a board for prayer requests and so on. I was very taken by the space. But it was, it was in, in this house, it was the place where nothing else happened but prayer. And so it was always available for, for prayer. I thought, what an intriguing idea, which of course is an ancient idea, but actually quite easy and practical to put into practice. Okay, Marcus and then and then over here. Yes. Yes. No, very good, Marcus. I don't know what it is that you're hoping for, if it's a revival in the church or a new reformation or uh, awakening and missions movement or a revival of monasticism or whatever. It probably isn't going to happen without, without regaining a sense of the discipline of prayer and how to do that as a community. Good. We have two comments over here. Yeah, very much appreciate that comment too. Tony, you get the last word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Good, good. I'm actually very surprised. Um, I've asked these questions of students before, and uh, I think this is the, the strongest response that I've received um, in, a, in a push for formalized prayer. There's obvious, and you've all said this very well, but there's, there's obvious benefits to that. What of your own relationships do you manage by 
completely unstructured interaction, right? Do you have relationships in your life that you A, care about, and B, that you allow to be completely unstructured? Probably not. Uh, if you're in a significant relationship with, with somebody else, do you ever think about those conversations before or after you have them? Well, quite obviously, yes. Would such, uh, such a type of, of thinking through conversations carefully, would that be fair in a relationship with God? Right. Apparently, we don't see why not. Uh, I'm going to let you all go in just a minute, and we're only halfway through the Augustinian rules, but let me tell you one story that, that I found uh, um, quite intriguing. It shows my own ignorance concerning uh, how to structure a life of prayer. I was in uh, France in 2003. <clears throat> I was in Strasbourg, France, because I thought that it was a bilingual territory, and I was trying to learn both uh, French and German at the time. Turned out that basically people only there spoke French. But I spent most of the summer uh, working as a volunteer uh, in a coffee shop and serving coffee to homeless people, which was a great experience. And in this coffee shop, there's kind of a bizarre experience. In this coffee shop, there was just a lot of different broken people. Um, so it was it was very much the, the homeless shelter environment. And um, there was... a people from Eastern Europe that would come in that had, this was before some of these Eastern European countries were part of the EU, but they had come into France looking for a better life and spent the night sleeping under bridges and running away from dogs and this kind of stuff. And they'd tell their stories. There was Maurice who would come in every morning and complain about how his wife left him for someone more wealthy. And there was a French philosopher that I tried to get to know a little bit. The French philosopher, for all that I was able to detect, was completely out of his mind. So he, it was, it was um, very sad to me to be able to see, but he had a PhD in philosophy and everybody revered him for this because he knew, he knew Kant and other philosophers. But the way that he would speak was very interesting too. He would like say something in German and then say it in French and then say it in English and all, always very basic phrases. And it just sort of rotate them through. He'd never quite focus on you. Anyway, one day I decided I'd finished cleaning up dishes, and I decided that I wanted to actually get to understand his views a little bit better. So I was talking to him about Christianity and what his views were. And I, I asked him um, um, how he prayed and, and when he prayed and so on, and he gave me the advice that we should only pray in the cathedral. I thought this was very odd. Now, Strasbourg has a wonderful cathedral. <clears throat> it's one of the world's most impressive uh, medieval cathedrals, and so it was just a few... Um, Stone, just a stone throw away from where we were, and so it was, of course, a part of the life of these people. But he was encouraging me to always pray in the cathedral. So I asked him, well, why do you pray in the cathedral? And he said, well, because that's the place to pray. And he happened to be dipping his tea bag in his hot water at this time, and had his cup sort of sideways, and so he was splashing out his tea quite a bit, which made me sort of nervously watch his tea more than take, advice, uh, take his... Um, his opinions about prayer seriously, but <clears throat> my brother was with me at the time, and we sort of this sort of became a saying for us all summer long. It's like, well, where should we pray? Let's pray in the cathedral because that's the place to pray. What a, what a simplistic approach to prayer. But then, after sort of thinking about this for the whole summer long and thinking about, you know, where did this idea come from? There was actually it, it struck me that there was actually a tremendous wisdom in that in having a dedicated space to pray. This was the time in my life when I was moving over away from uh, from only extemporaneous prayer, which I think is great too. You can have really you, know, uh, um, you can have really intense, joyful times of just completely extemporaneous prayer. I love that. I think there's a great space for that too. But it's not the totality of what prayer is and should be in a Christian life. So so I give that story to you as a uh, pray in the cathedral because that's the place to pray. All right. Scholars, I need to let you go to take your uh, first break. Come back at uh, 9 o'clock punctually. I don't think we'll have a quiz. Okay, so come back punctually, even though we don't have a quiz waiting for you at 9. Thank you.
Scholars, are you ready to get back to work? <clears throat> Why don't you go ahead and find seats if you can, and we'll start up again. All right, so we've got three of the Augustinian rules down. We're headed towards seven altogether, so let's keep moving. All right, a nice simple one. This is Augustine's rule number four. Keep the flesh under by fasting and by abstinence from meat and drink so far as health allows. Well, that's pretty easy to summarize. Fast. Very quickly, I don't want to derail us, but um, why don't we fast today, or do you fast? I'm not exercised in fasting. I, ne I don't know how to do it and have learned to do it, but any of you fast, and how did you learn to do it? Anybody want to speak to that? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Good. Any of you fast on like a monthly basis or on a regular basis? And how did you learn to do that? What does it mean to you when you fast? We'll just take, I won't belabor it, but very quickly, Tony. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Yep. Okay. Wow. It's, it's a staple part of the monastic tradition. And it's, it's, it's one of the components that is most foreign to myself, and, and I'm guessing maybe to some of you as well. Um, it's I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on fasting, um, but, it's, but it's a huge part of the monastic tradition, and so um, there's there's no doubt a lot of wisdom there that I just simply don't understand through experience. But it pops up everywhere in monastic life, and for whatever for whatever um, for whatever it's worth, it can, seems to be consistently an avenue that people are. Are, they're seeking God. They're trying to get close to God. They're trying to hear God's voice, sometimes, literally. And, and it's through fasting that this exercise is done. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Good, Tony. Thanks. Chase. Let me, because I don't have the experience to actually interact with that at a deep level, let me just tabulate that comment. Very interesting, Chase. And I think oh, those of us who are not exercised in it probably share that concern. Wait a minute. I'm most functional mentally and physically when I'm well fed, it seems. So how could it seem quite paradoxical that by limiting one's food, one could actually become more spiritually aware? It doesn't seem to be the way that we experience life normally. All I'd say is it sounds like you and I haven't done it, so I'm not. So we need we need an outside perspective, don't we? Um, I do know again when I was close to the Jesuit community that that uh, fasting, particularly, actually people would train to do. They would learn how to do this from a mentor. And I think there there must be wisdom in that. Throughout church history, there's a few cases of people who destroy their health through fasting improperly. So I know that it can be overdone as well. Um, but it seems to be it seems to be a, a, a physical skill that people learn. And okay, good. Uh, we'll move on quickly in a moment here. Because, but Jason. Yeah. 
Yes. Right. Right. And I've seen that pop up in monastic literature very often as well. Again, I don't have the experience to know, but I've seen the correlation often in monastic literature. There seems to be a widespread belief that by being careful with the pleasures of food, that the monks would actually be better able to control sexuality as well and to, to maintain abstinence. So that crops up all over the place. It seems that people would exercise this discipline as a way of keeping balanced sexually as well, which frankly I, I don't understand, but that's I see it often. Good. Tony. Okay. Good. So there's there's a biblical basis for that too. Josh and Brady, and I'll just Braden and I'll move us on. Great. That you could do lifelong. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Good. That's very good, too. Yeah. No, excellent. I don't need to, to underscore that. You've done great job. Brady, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there, good. No, there's something terribly countercultural about this. Cultural about this. We tend to think, when I have enough, then I'll be able to give to others or share life in this capacity. When I have enough surplus time and well-being and and resources, then I'll be able to share with others. And apparently, it seems that the monastic approach to God is sort of the reverse of that. By emptying oneself, by by heading straight into our dependence, that's the place where we can actually connect with God. Seems to be what they were about. All right. Um, rule five, <clears throat> let your apparel be in no wise conspicuous and aspire to please others by your behavior rather than by your attire. Through a passing glance, be directed towards any man. Let your eyes not look fixedly at none, for when you were walking, you were not forbidden to see men. Remember, he's speaking to a community of women here. But you must neither let your desires go out to them nor uh, wish to become objects of desire on their part. All right, how would you paraphrase rule five of Augustine's rule? Quickly, let's move quickly. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, there you go. Or specifically, don't, don't desire to become objects of desire on their part, right? Don't, don't desire to become, um, yeah, don't desire to become an object of desire on their part. Good. Yeah, we'll just abbreviate uh, no men, <laughs> no opposite sex. Yeah, there's a, right, Monasti monasticism is a, is a movement that operates by celibacy. So that's, that's a mainstay of the movement. That's something that we can look at the entirety of monasticism and say it's consistent. Good. And the reverse, obviously, vice versa for a, a male community was the same as well. I thought it was interesting, too. I mean, these, these women... I, I thought it was uh, entirely reasonable of of Augustine to say here it's um, it's not that you are forbidden to see men. And these are these are women who are going to be selling things at the market. They're going to have um, other relationships and they're going to have business transactions and so on. They're going to sell things at the market and so on. So uh, they're they're not cloistered in that sense, which is you know they're not 
not allowed to leave the compound or something like that. But it's just a, there's just a rigidity in their relations there. Good, and I, I, uh, this is actually a continuation of Rule 5. I thought it was very interesting. Augustine writes, and if you perceive in any one uh, your number, this forwardness of I, warn her at once, so that the evil which is begun may not, may not go on, but be checked immediately. And do not think that in thus informing upon one another you are guilty of malevolence, but the truth rather is that you are not guiltless if, you keep, if by keeping silence you allow sisters to perish, whom you may correct by giving information of their faults. So I thought this was a uh, um, very interesting. Augustine is talking about if uh, you notice that any of your sisters are like receiving flowers from the outside, huh, you better tattle on one another so that we can get this business taken care of. Uh, no secret love affairs and so on. I thought it was, I don't know, I'm giggling because I thought, man, they've been using flowers and chocolates forever. Yeah, that's, that's what they were using back in the Middle Ages as well. All right. <clears throat> Augustine continues, I'll just paraphrase, but he's justifying why he wants sisters to, to keep one another accountable. And he says, well, look, if one of you had some sort of wasting disease or something like that, you saw, you perceived this in somebody else, you wouldn't cover that up, would you? What's going to happen if you cover up these secret love affairs? Well, actually, it's going to be like a cancer that eats away at the society and, and specifically uh, the, the sister who's involved. So the advice here is, look, if it were a medical condition, it wouldn't be a mercy to cover it up. No, no, you expose that so you can actually get it dealt with. And that's Augustine's approach uh, that he suggests about dealing with uh, illicit relationships as well. Eric, your comment. Yes. Uh, so the, the answer is the former. Uh, um, the the they took vows. They took a veil. They took vows. They were life members of this community. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a good point, Eric. It seems to me that a lot of these principles are actually very powerful, and that by creating sort of this uh, this life vow, very few of us are actually going to engage seriously or reflect seriously about creating a community like that or joining a community like that. It's just too long of a commitment, and and it just is too antithetical to who. To, to our worldview today. It's just not going to work. If it were a short-term commitment, I think you might be able to get some of the benefits of the, that lifestyle. You might actually be able to resurrect something of that model. If people were to you know, uh, vow three years of their life, oh, well, that's doable. We could talk about that. So if somebody did want to choose to get married at the end of that period, fine. They could do that. But that they were committing for a smaller block of time. I, you could actually probably get monasticism to work again if you had uh, something of that, um, a shorter time commitment. All right, rule number six, and let's just shoot through these quickly because I want to get us on. Keep your clothes in one place under the care of one or two or as many as may be required to shake them so as to keep them from being injured by moths. That's the way you did laundry in, in the Middle Ages. You just kicked the clothes to make sure that the moths would fly away. And as your, <laughs> it's true. And as your food is supplied from one storeroom, let your clothes be provided from one wardrobe. All right. So communal, communal clothes and food. The efficiency of it was incredible. If everybody's wearing the same thing, then everybody know, then you can have a couple sisters take care of the clothes, and uh, um, it's just massively more efficient. Good. All right, rule number seven, obey the prioress as a mother, giving her all due honor that God may not be offended by your forgetting what, you're owe to, what you owe to her. Still more, it is incumbent on you to obey the presbyter who is charge of you all. Rule seven, and this too will become a consistent thing in monasticism, in other forms of monasticism. What is that? How do you say that? Oh, it's obedience obedience to the spiritual authority. That's going to be a consistent um, part of medieval monasticism. And again, something that's very antithetical to our native culture, where we so uh, um, uh, pride ourselves on um, liberty, on, on uh, individual freedoms, on the ability to be creative and choose our own way. Obedience has a very low priority in our culture, which is what's going to make monasticism such a foreign idea generally. All right, here's what I'd like you to do. In, oh, 
I, if I give you too much time, you're going to have far too much fun. So I'm going to give you a short period of time here. But I'll give you six minutes. And what I'd like you to do is to get into your groups and to devise rules for your monastery. Mm -hmm. so, it's, it'll be a fun six minutes. So actually write rules for your monastic community. Uh, these are Augustine's rules. You can pick and choose or create new rules as you wish. And actually try to get a few serious rules in there as well. So don't make this just fun and games. Actually try to put some serious rules in there. And what I'd like you to think about too is um, what is the focus of your community? So by th these monastic communities, by living communally, communally, by vowing chastity, they had a tremendous surplus that allowed these different communities to specialize in different things. They could, they could take on, there was a lot of extra energy in these communities to do some form of other outside ministry. So as you're designing your own monastery, I'd like you to reflect too on what is the purpose of this organization? What is it that your community is actually intending to do with this extra surplus of energy and resources that your community presumably will amass? So let me know that as well. I've got you on the timer. You've got six minutes to write your own rule. Was that? Yes, to Pete Elliott.
class. <clears throat> Glad to hear you enjoyed yourself. <laughs> um, I made that a very, very short assignment because I thought you'd probably be able to get the best of your creative uh, energies out and because I actually wanted to poll some of you. So send in those responses to Peter Elliott. There's no thesis required with it, but send in those ideas anyway so that there's accountability for your work. But share with me briefly, what are the rules that you've got for your house? Chase, you're on because your hand's up first. Go ahead. Why? <laughs> okay, in emulation of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. That's that's lovely. Okay. What else, Chase? We do that anyway. <laughs> it's our form of fasting. Okay. Any other rules for your community? How about a spiritually productive rule? <laughs> wow. Somebody in the community is reading scripture all the time, but you, you pass that baton. Great. Cool. Prearranged marriages? How does that go with monasticism? Okay. That, uh, no, it certainly is that like a marketing scheme, Chase? Or <laughs> come to our monastery, you'll get a free marriage out of it. <laughs> Well, I can see why there were giggles in your group, but <laughs> any other rules? Spiritually fruitful rules? That'll, <laughs> rules that'll bring us closer to God? <laughs> he said very hopefully. Prayer? Okay. <laughs> there was something about prayer in there. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Chase. Good. Share a couple rules with us, please. So that just means don't shave. There's no shaving in the monastery. Okay. Great. How do you do that, Jason? Well, so the emphasis is on the constant, but what does it mean for your community? How do you know if the brothers are doing this? Okay. And, and what is it that somebody's going to do that you'll know they're turning toward God? What does it mean to turn toward God? But I, how would you know if somebody's turning towards God? That's what I'm stuck at. All right. Keep going, Jason. Good. So the ministry of this monastery is actually benevolence to the poor. Super. Cool. Urban agriculture? Sweet. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Some of these rules were very spiritually productive, I think. Very good. Sounds great. That's another marketing scheme. Yep. Come to our monastery. You'll never be sleep deprived again. That's wonderful. Go ahead. Share a couple rules. Hmm. Ah, I'm with you. Okay. So this is like monastery slash fun house. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Another marketing scheme. But I'd show up for those events. Keep going. That's a great idea. That's a, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Great. So it's, again, sort of a benevolence to the poor mission. Good. All of these communities presumably are actually generating surplus, so there's there's a, a generous space to create mission and mission emphasis there. Okay, good. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> 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 
My imagination is limited, so help me out. <laughs> All righty. I'm amazed by the levity that this exercise brings on. All I ask you to do is construct a few spiritually fruitful rules. Good. Um, is there, was there a monastery that was predominantly female? Could we hear from you? Go ahead. Watch each other. Wash each other's feet. Cool. Okay. Yes. This is another form of modern fasting, isn't it? So, yeah, fasting, internet, fasting, phone, cool. That's almost Didi. Yeah, another sort of benevolence to the poor, mission focus, cool, cool, good. All right, I was um, I was intrigued by this idea because actually. It's such a foreign concept to us, and my suspicions have only been confirmed by your responses that this is a really weird idea. But in the broader scheme of Christianity, this is how a lot of stuff gets done. Uh, and it has got done. Like, okay, I was in Nairobi, Kenya a couple years ago and saw I, what was, I was told was the second largest slum in the world. There was four million people living in this city outside of the city where literally people were in cardboard and dung huts for, for miles, okay? What force, what mission force is actually going to uh, enter that world? Your, our current mission model will never touch that community. So, so reflect on that. What is your own value of world evangelization, okay? I think, I'm trying to tap into what I, what I think is one of your strongest values. How are you going to accomplish your own goals uh, to participate in world evangelization with a model where everybody's supposed to get married and have kids. No, it's not going to work. You know, you, you will so damage your effectiveness to actually spread the gospel if that's your only ab ability to imagine how Christianity is embodied. Um, so let me just burden your souls with that for a while. <laughs> All right. I, I was... I was uh, talking with a friend of mine again when I was at Fordham University. He was uh, um, uh, uh, one of the Jesuits, so he was, he'd come to Fordham University to study, study philosophy. He was there for a few years, and then he was part of a novitiate. The process to becoming a Jesuit is a 12-year long process. It's the spiritual equivalent to becoming a brain surgeon, I suppose. And he was there for his uh, philosophy studies, the Jesuit study of three years of philosophy before they touched theology. All right. So he was there. But while he was there, he, he was from Poland. He went back to Poland for a summer. And he came back just radiant, telling me about this experience that he had. I was met, meeting him. So I was heading out to the library. And I uh, said, hey, how was your time over the summer? It was incredible. I went back to Poland. There was a number of professionals. He had been an accountant before he joined the Jesuits. So he had a profession. He said that there was a number of people living, in, professional Jesuits in training, living in this house in Poland. They uh, lived so simply, and they were working hard, so they amassed considerably a, a, a considerable amount of money. What did they do with this money? Well, they they were they were finance people, so they put it into investments, and then they loaned it out to church initiatives and and Christian businesses that they wanted to support. They amassed so much money, it sort of became its own lending institution, and it was just a couple guys. It was like twelve. But it was, a, it was a, a group of professional people who, out of self-sacrifice, decided to live an alternate lifestyle. And you can do amazing things with that. So think about it. Okay, somebody else got one or two spiritually fruitful rules for your monastery, and then we'll move on. Go ahead, Cameron. Sweet. Sweet. Actually, something like that could be feasible, right? Yep. Those of you who have experience with homeless ministry, you know it's a culture. If you actually get into that culture and understand it, yep, you, you could do ministry through that avenue. That's very, very interesting. Good. My only point was to teach you a little bit about the history of monasticism and also to open your minds um, 
because it seems to me, I, I want you to see, that I will be a, a, a happy teacher if I've challenged you to actually seriously consider a possibility of, of a monastic type of lifestyle. Because there are things that are, there are uh, pro professed goals for world evangelization and ministry and things like this that our community can't begin to actually achieve because the only way that we conceive of Christian life is through uh, a family model. Real people grow up and get married and have children. And everybody in our churches who aren't following that are sort of in a waiting stage for crying out loud. Is that the only way we understand Christian life to work? It'll be terribly limiting at our actual ministry. So let's, let's move on before I get into trouble. Okay. Let's talk about the Benedictine monks. <clears throat> Let's talk about the rule of St. Benedict. Thanks, thanks everyone for your patience in engaging in that. Medieval monasticism, um, the, the most popular form of medieval monasticism was Benedictine monasticism. So let me introduce you to that. I'm pretty sure we won't get to talking about medieval exegesis today, but we probably will finish up talking about various monastic movements, many of which were modeled on this Benedictine form. So let's get to know Benedictine monasticism just a little bit. Unlike Augustine's rule for community life, Benedict actually did write a rule. Augustine's rule was composed from different pieces that he wrote and, and, and sort of posthumously put into a formal rule, but Benedict's rule was actually uh, formally written during his own lifetime. Benedict had a, had a hand in, in getting that document started and written. Benedict was inspired by many others, uh, any, many other ascetic writers, especially John Cassian. John Cassian, who lived from 360 to 435, one of the Desert Fathers, so here's a connection between that early desert form of Anchoritic monasticism and what becomes this predominant form of medieval monasticism. Cassian, John Cassian, one of the Desert Fathers, wrote extensively on the ascetic life. He wrote the, quote, institutions and then also the conferences, and that transmits to the West this, this, uh, this wisdom of the Desert Fathers. John Cassian spent some time in monasteries of Egypt, but then he also brought this lifestyle to the monasteries in Gaul. Benedict of Nursia, we could, I think it was uh, David Calhoun, but it may have been Everett Ferguson, I'm not sure who said this, but um, I think it was David Calhoun who said that if we think of Benedict of Nursia as the father of medieval monasticism, then John Cassian we could consider the, the quote, grandfather of medieval monasticism. Benedict of Nursia, he was born in about the year 480 and lived to about 547. He's celebrated in the Roman Catholic Communion as the patron saint of students and of Europe. How would you like to hold that title? And he founded several monasteries around Rome before arriving at Monte Cassino, M-O-N-T-E-C-A-S-S-I-N-O, -S -S which has nothing to do with gambling. Uh, but that is, it's the name of the mount where he settled. But it, this is, became the mother house of the Benedictine monasteries. And the Benedictine order becomes the most powerful uh, form of monasticism in the Middle Ages. What, uh, how, what is the Benedicti Benedictine life? How did it work? What happened? Well, the principle of the Benedictine life is ora et labora. Ora et labora, which means pray and work and you will become a very successful monastery if you do this. It's a pretty simple formula. Pray and work. The desert fathers, these anchoritic monks, were often, um, they didn't have occupations, per se. They lived on, apparently, the air they breathed. So they lived on very little. Some of them who became more famous, people would give them gifts of food and other things. Uh, but they were not working communities per se. They were, I suppose, uh, um, yeah, very primitive community, very primitive lifestyles that the anchoritic um, 
monks in Egypt lived, I suppose we could say they were scavenging for food as well as probably tiny individual gardens and that sort of thing. Um, the Benedictines got organized. So in pursuit of this very simple lifestyle, but they were organized. And that was part of their success. Um, what, did the, what did the Benedictine lifestyle look like? And again, when, when we're looking at the individual uh, operations of this, this uh, Benedictine lifestyle, we're looking at something that was lived in times thousands and thousands across the European landscape for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. They, ri they rose early. The, the, the Benedictine life was ordered around seven offices. These offices were basically very short chapel services of about half an hour each, where the whole community, at living different parts of their life and, and working at different projects and doing different things, seven times during the day whoosh, would come to the chapel area of the monastery and perform an office. It, it would be like a, a very short chapel service. And they had seven of those every day. The monks rose very early in the morning, at 2 o'clock in the morning. Did any of you write that into your monastery rules? No. <laughs> I wouldn't have either, because I do really like my sleep. But the, the Benedictines went to bed very, very early. They went to bed at about 6 p.m., so they actually got eight hours of sleep. They functioned well like this. <clears throat> they celebrated lauds, the office of lauds at dawn, prime at sunrise, Vespers at dusk and Compline at night. Have any of you been to a Compline service? Do we have Compline services here? Sometimes they pop up at different Christian college campuses. Any of you been to a Compline service? It's like a chapel that you have right before, right before sleeping time. No? Okay. Fine. That the Compline services, if you've been to one of them, is loosely inspired by the Benedictine lifestyle. If you put all of the things together, sort of add up, what is it that the Benedictine monks did throughout the day? They had three and a half hours of devotional uh, um, offices. So three and a half hours they were in chapel, effectively, every day, which was community prayer and also scripture reading. They prayed through the Psalms every week. And some of the Benedictines, who were real studs, would pray through the entire Psalter every day. So you can imagine you get this memorized, right? How are you not going to memorize this? I lived in a theological house for, uh, or a, I should say a house for theology students while I was in Germany, and they had a very, very simple form of community life, but it was very moving to me to experience even a taste of this style of life. Seven o'clock, we'd get up and have a, uh, a short chapel service. We would pray through a, a Lutheran liturgy, um, which only lasted about 15 minutes or something like that. There'd be like a five-minute devotional that one of the students in the house would have prepared. And then somewhere around 725, something like that, we'd release for breakfast together. We'd go have a community meal. And doing that, especially as a foreign language student where I was uh, new to the whole environment, that was, that was a very, very powerful experience for me. And it, it bonds you together as a community, this type of lifestyle. So the monks would spend about three and a half hours in devotional offices. They would sleep for about eight hours or about eight and a half hours. They would work for about six and a half hours a day. Sounds a little bit. Oh, and they would study for about four and a half hours for reading, meditation, scripture copying, and so on. Sounds kind of like the life of a student, doesn't it? Yes, that's why Benedict is the patron saint of students. And actually, amazingly, the student lifestyle, I think the student lifestyle is changing pretty rapidly. I don't think it'll look, well, it may look the same as it does 50 years from now, but the student lifestyle is very much in a process of transition. Uh, but vaguely, you can still see uh, a glimmer of monastic life in the lifestyle that institutions of higher education erect for their students. And I think I've already told you this too, so I'll just touch on it, but you remember that um, when I was talking about some of the very oldest colleges in the world at Oxford University, they were originally convents, right? They were actually convents or monasteries, and then they were taken over by colleges. There's this very intimate connection between the university life in its traditional form and the monastic life. And we can see this with the Benedictines. All right, what, are the, okay, what was the Benedictine meal plan? What would these people eat? Well, um, what I appreciate about the Benedictines is that, and, and the Augustinians too is they understood that food is actually something that 
is, is experienced pretty differently for different people. So in their rules about fasting, too, there was quite a lot of grace with people because people have very different relationships with food. And that's something that's apparently been true for a very, very long time. But there, so there was an effort among the Benedictines to accommodate different people's needs and their dietary needs. Here's what the Benedictine meal plan looked like. There was a large meal at noon, and that was the main meal of the day. But there would also be a light supper later on, and depending on the preference of the brothers and the abbot. And there was supposed to be two hot dishes available at the main meal, so that even if one of the brothers or sisters didn't like this or that dish, they would still have something that they could enjoy. And depending on the time of year, there might be seasonal fruits or vegetables or that sort of thing along, uh, uh, served also with the meal. What is the backbone of the Benedictine life? This, this life, or I should say, the, the backbone of the Benedictine life is ora et labora, pray and work, and the principle in operation is obedience. Obedience to the spiritual authority becomes this uh, uh, hard, rigid part of the, the monastic, the Benedictine life. There are 12 specific rules in the Benedictine rule, and I'm just going to give you a sampling of some of them. It seems to me that the first rules that are laid out in the order make pretty good sense to us. And then the further that we go down in these 12 rules, the more and more that they become strange, at least to myself and I think perhaps to you as well. But the, the ordering principle of the rules of the Benedictine rule is is obedience to the spiritual authority. Listen to the way the Benedictine rule opens. The document says, Son, listen to the precepts of your master. Take them to your heart willingly. If you follow the advice of a tender father and travel the hard road of obedience, you will return to God from whom by obedience you have gone astray. The first rule among the Benedictines is obedience to, to the spiritual authority. This is a very foreign concept. Let me try to explain it in a way that I hope will make sense to you, but, but be that as it may, it still may remain a very uh, frightfully odd idea. And especially a culture that's so used to abuse of authority, we're so, um, we're so suspicious of authority because every time it seems to appear, it's abused. And so we think, uh-oh. Uh, couldn't possibly be a, a good system to have uh, such an emphasis on obedience in the monastery. All right, point well taken. Here's what I think the monks were doing and why they understood obedience to be so important. In the spiritual system of the, the in monastic piety, pride is the archetypical sin, and humility is the archetypical virtue that will lead us back to God. So if humility is the pursuit that, that we're ordering the entire monastic life around, the way to demonstrate humility is submission to authority. We, if in pride, we will reject authority. We'll, and, and what are we doing? When we reject the authority of others, we're stating that we ourselves must know better, that we're in a position to better be able to assess the, the situation, or our own needs, etc. cetera. Uh, and that is pride say the monks. So if we're actually pursuing a life of humility, the, that necessitates a life of obedience to authority. That's what the monks were thinking, whether or not you agree with their conclusions. <clears throat> so we demonstrate this humility as Benedictines through obedience to the superior. The monk is to esteem others better than himself, and therefore that means to accept authority. There are 12 degrees of humility, and I, I think I misspoke. I said there were 12 rules within the rule. No, I should have said that there are 12 degrees of humility exercised by this community, so please correct your notes accordingly. What are those 12 degrees of humility? Well, the first is to fear God, being aware of God's presence, contemplating God, being always in a state as though God were present with us, because in faith we believe that God is with us. How would we act if we assumed that God was with us always? That, that's the Benedictine pursuit of humility in the fear of God. It would be very difficult to live lives of pride, self-indulgence, if God were actually present with you. 
And the Benedictine lifestyle is a life pursuing what would I live if God were there, because I believe he's there. The second degree of humility is to seek God's will, not our own, because in humility we recognize that God knows what's best for us. The third degree of humility is submission to the, superior, the spiritual superior, because we believe that that spiritual superior is in touch with God's authority. The fourth degree of humility is to be patient in hardship. All right. You can envision that, right? The monks are out working in their fields. It's not even light out. They got up at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, and it's cold outside. Um, but in humility, they persevere under hardship because they're doing this for the good of the community. It's not their own well-being or comfort that is their top priority. Fifth degree of humility is to confess one's sins to the abbot. Past this, the degrees of humility start to look very strange to us. Listen to this. The seventh degree of humility, for example, is to believe in one's heart that one is the worst human being alive. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. The tenth degree of humility is to not laugh easily. Hmm. That doesn't even sound good to our culture, right? I mean, levity is something that, that we appreciate. The tenth degree of humility is to not. Oh, excuse me. The eleventh degree of humility is not to. Spe it is to speak as little as possible. Hmm. We see it, this sounds a little bit more spooky. It sounds like the soul of the person is dwindling away. The twelfth degree is to allow one's inner inadequacies be reflected in one's outward comportment. So you feel miserable, look miserable too. Hmm. There, it's very difficult to assess, for me to assess. Uh, the value, the spiritual value of this medieval prescription for how life is to work because while I'm tracking with these early degrees of humility, at some point I, so I need to get off the train as well. It doesn't sound psychologically healthy. Um, be that my own uh, prejudice of the day. At any rate, it seems to me that this, um, this spirit of sobriety, which seems to go past just sobriety as I understand it, but even into, um, yeah, a focus on one's own inadequacies, um, that, that perhaps reflects the zeitgeist or the, the spirit of the Middle Ages more than it does Christianity. I don't know. I'm conflicted about that. On the one hand, um, it's easy for us to criticize a culture that's so obsessed with self-confidence and self-affirmation and for crying out loud, why don't you do something worthy of praise and then somebody else will praise you, as the Proverbs say, right? Why, why this desperate need to affirm ourselves? Uh, it's easy to criticize that as, a, as, a, as an, a, uh, an imbalance in our own culture, but it seems to me, too, that some of the pessimism of the Middle Ages uh, crept into this form of monasticism. I... I, I was encouraged when I was with the Jesuit community and learning a little bit of their ways. I, was, I had an apologetics class with Avery Cardinal Dulles. There was just a few of us in the room. And uh, on breaks, we'd head out and go to the back space and have some cookies and whatever else. And um, on our way out of the classroom, we would pass this picture on the wall of Jesus laughing. And the, the Jesuit community that I was learning uh, from I think the point of that picture was to emphasize that, that Jesus could rejoice too and that laughter was okay. There was a very different view about levity than there was here in the Middle Ages. It was a striking image of Jesus on the wall. Here was Jesus, head thrown back, eyes closed, shut tight, face contorted with laughter. I'd never seen an image of Jesus like that before. It's almost like you could almost imagine like tears of laughter streaming down Jesus' cheeks. Hmm. It's a very striking image for me to, to contemplate and to see Jesus in that. Cardinal Dulles told me that one of the prerequisites for sainthood today, so if any of you are planning to becoming saints in the Roman Catholic Church, take note, you need to be a joyful person. That's actually one of the things that you need if you're going to successfully fill out paperwork with the Vatican to become a saint. So our view of, of, of levity, of, of human joy, has perhaps changed a bit from the Middle Ages. Any questions? That's all I want to say about the Benedictines properly. We'll get to some of the other forms of medieval monasticism, several of which are actually revival movements of the Benedictine lifestyle. But do any of you have any questions at this point? Okay, you're all... Oh, 
Go ahead. Yes. Good. To tell you the truth, I don't know, and I only have those down on my notes. So I can't recite all the rules of humility, but quickly Google rules of humility, or excuse me, degrees of humility, Benedictine rule, and I'm sure the list will pop up. Thanks, Keith. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh-oh. Did I confuse people there? So what I meant to say uh, is that the organizing principle, the spiritual principle behind all of these, the, the Benedictine rule, is this rigid obedience to spiritual authority. The first degree of humility is to fear God. Good. Any other questions? Yep, go ahead, Nick. Yes, good, thank you. The, the short of it would be, um, thanks for reminding me that once again I haven't given proper attention to the, the Greek East. Monasticism is hugely important uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Communion today as well. There's, there's um, actually probably more emphasis put on monastic lifestyles in, in uh, Eastern Orthodoxy than there is even in the Roman Catholic Church. And I think I was talking to Andrew Louth, uh, which some of you listened to that interview. Some of the things that he was most excited about was actually this revival of monasticism. No, actually, this was uh, Paul Gavrilouk, I think I was talking to. Anyway, the Eastern Orthodox, when they talk about revival movements in their own communion, what are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the revival that's taking place in Mount Athos today and back from a few years, a couple decades ago as well. Some of the things that most encourage uh, some of the Eastern Orthodox representatives that I've talked to have been the continuing robustness of monasticism in the present. All right, but back in this day, sure, monasticism was still going. To my, okay, St. Basil of Caesarea has a monastic rule, so I would look into that to see if, if his monastic rule, how popular was it? And I'm sorry, Nick, I just don't know, but it may be that just as the Augustinian rule became massively popular, Perhaps the rule of St. Basil had a, had a uh, parallel life there in the East. That's where I begin. Thanks, Nick. Good, good reminder. Okay, anything else? All right. Let me talk to you about the Abbey of Cluny. The Abbey of Cluny, okay, so Benedictine monasticism really gets going in the 6th century. The Abbey of Cluny is... I think the best way to think of it is, is of this revival movement within Benedictine uh, monasticism that takes place in the 10th and the 11th century. And during its height, the Abbey of Cluny, which is a network of Benedictine monasteries, becomes one of the most powerful institutions in Christianity. It rivals the official church as, as wielding the most real power in Christendom in this period in the Middle Ages. In 1048, the Abbey of Cluny and its associate networks begin to wane a bit because that, in 1048, is the moment when Pope Leo IX makes Rome the center for the Gregorian reform movement, and so Rome becomes a, a larger player in the monasticism of the day. But until then, from, from about the, the uh, middle of the 10th century to about the middle of the 11th century. The Abbey of Cluny is one of the most powerful institutions in Christendom, period. Where did this abbey come from? What was it? Well, it was Benedictine, so it lived out the lifestyle that we've already described. Uh, Cluny is a city in central eastern France. Perhaps you could find that for us, Palmer. That would be uh, kind of you. It's not far from the Swiss border. Perhaps we'll get a, a map of that in just a moment. In 909 AD, Duke William of Aquitaine founds a Benedictine monastery in Cluny. The monastery that he planted there thrives beyond his wildest dreams, and the success of the Abbey of Cluny was the revival of Benedictine monasticism during its day. The Abbey of Cluny was founded with the principle that the monastery should uphold in exact detail 
the Benedictine rule. And we're going to see this at other points in times too. You see, the the life cycle of monasticism in the Middle Ages with this Benedictine uh, style was that this life of discipline and hard work would generate wealth. And then, predictably, that wealth uh, would create uh, a power structure. It would express itself in a particular power structure. And you all know what Lord Acton said, that power corrupts. We see this too often also in medieval monasticism. This wealthy monastic community would become disillusioned as, as authorities abuse their power. Uh, um, and eventually things would spiritually decline. And we see this again and again. Um, this Benedictine monastery that William of Aquitaine decides to found, they wanted to get back to real Benedictine uh, lifestyle. They were going to follow the Benedictine rule to the T. And enough with this wealth and pomp and, and uh, abuse of power that was taking place in their communities. The movement, however, had a very uh, humble beginning. Well, the monastery was still in the very early decades of its life. Uh, the, the community had, had... Thank you so much, there, Palmer. The community had uh, finally built a church. They had uh, finally amassed enough uh, material goods to be able to buy this church, to construct this church. And the bishop of the neighboring city of Maison in France came over to incur with his entourage to consecrate the church. The monks, who were very poor at this time, weren't exactly sure how they were going to feed this, this uh, noble guest. But the story is told that one of the brothers was in the kitchen, and he hears this banging on the door. He looks over to see, out to see what's happened, and this pig, this very large, fat pig, has come up onto the porch outside the kitchen and lain down against the door, probably because it was warm. Aha! So one of the brothers runs out, grabs a spear, whoosh! Now we know what we're going to have for dinner when this uh, bishop and this wealthy ecclesiastical official comes. Aha, they had wild boar. But it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very slow beginning to what becomes this very powerful institution. Um, during the height of its power, this network, and, and I suppose the power of monastic life too is that it's reproducible, that this system of life can easily be learned, or relatively easily learned, and then set up in another location. So the Abbey of Cluny, here where Palmer has shown us on the map, that becomes the center, an administrative center for a whole network of monasteries. And people who became important officials in this, this Cluny movement uh, became some of the most significant power-wielding uh, um, ecclesiastical figures in the medieval church world. The Cistercians, so that is enough for the, the Cluniac order. The Cistercians, another powerful movement within medieval monasticism, is again another revival movement within Benedictine monasticism. It's again a, a founding of a new monastery under the understanding that the old Benedictine ways has become too, uh, too worldly. They were too successful. They gained too much wealth and power and Again, there's this the inevitable abuse of the power, and these monks were going out to find a new humble lifestyle where they could exercise the pursuit of God, because that's, after all, what they were after. The man who founded uh, the, the monastery, the first monastery in the Cistercian group, it was founded at Sitio, and maybe you can find that too, Palmer, if you'd be willing to. If that's in the notes, that's great. Otherwise, it's spelled C-I-T-E-A-U-W. Uh, and Robert of Molisme was the man who founded this monastery uh, in 1098. Again, it was this back-to-the-roots uh, vision for what monast uh, the monastery life should be. Um, as these other forms of Benedictine monastery, uh, monastic life became increasingly wealthy, they would lose the principle. The monks would give up on this principle of working. They didn't need to work. They would dedicate themselves to other administrative pursuits and other things. Uh, but with this, the beginning of the Cistercians, uh, Robert of Molisme wanted to make sure that the Benedictines continued this life of labor because that was spiritually productive. It wasn't only economically necessary. It was spiritually productive. Thank you so much, Palmer. So there was an emphasis on this manual labor. And 
the Cistercians developed because of this emphasis on keep it back to the basics, keeping uh, a focus on manual labor. The Cistercians actually become uh, um, incredibly valuable and skilled workers in the Middle Ages. They, with their their spiritual discipline of labor, they develop um, some of the most amazing technological breakthroughs in the Middle Ages. They have phenomenal success with their developments here. Those who are in the know, for example, can tell when they're looking at a Cistercian manuscript. I'm not skilled at this. I haven't studied Cistercian art, but I know that it's very distinct and that those with an eye for it can look at an illumination like what we have here and say, aha, this is quite obviously a Cistercian make. They, they became, one of the ways that they invested their work was to create manuscripts and, and uh, manuscripts of the Bible or of other ancient works. They became ex, uh, uh, very experienced uh, bookmakers. But there were many, many other s forms of uh, industri industry that these Cistercians engaged in as well. Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux, a name that you've already been introduced to when we were talking about the Second Crusade, he, he came to start a new monastery of the Cistercian Order with about 30 companions and participated in this growing monastic movement. I think it's terribly exciting that, that uh, I never thought of monasticism as something that could boom, something that could grow and expand. But actually, that's, that's the way it was growing in the Middle Ages. It was, uh, it was an exciting movement to be a part of. It was going to do something revolutionary, change the landscape of, of the church in the Middle Ages. It was going to be a reform agent. By the end of the 1100s, the movement had spread throughout Europe and had become this phenomenal success. The Cistercians are partially to be credited with the substantial economic uh, and technological advances of the High Middle Ages. I've talked to you about the High Middle Ages, this time of relative prosperity. A part, a part of that boom in the economy was actually due to the innovations of the Cistercians, who become sort of the engineers of the Middle Ages with their spiritual emphasis on work. They transform agriculture. So here's a group of skilled people who are dedicating their whole energies to agriculture. What happens? Well, they get organized. They create uh, uh, bodies of laborers. They develop many improvements to the medieval farming system. They get organized on how to breed livestock, how to sell them at market. They have the most efficiently run farms of uh, all of the Middle Ages. It's not long before the farms are so successful in growing that they have to hire, quote, lay brothers, that is, peasants, to actually do the work uh, of feeding the animals and so on, and that the uh, Benedictines are consumed with administrative responsibilities of running these huge farms. Uh-oh, you know th what that means. You know that probably there was power creeping into the institution. How about this? The Cistercians didn't invent the water wheel, but they figured out that you could do amazing things with it. You know about the uh, Industrial Revolution, right? That begins in the 1700s with James Watt's steam engine. Well, before the steam engine came along, the water wheel was the big engine of, of, uh, of the medieval world. L literally the large engine. It was, it was the... Uh, uh, the, the device that captured and could transfer energy for work. What is it that the Cistercians did with the water wheel? They did all kinds of crazy inventive things. <clears throat> they, uh, um, these Cistercian monasteries were often founded near sources of water and they would capture that water power. What did they use the water wheel for? Well, they would mill wheat. They would pump water for cooking or drinking. They, used, they would create a wood chopping machine. Sweet. You thought Maurice from the Beauty and the Beast invented that. No, actually the Cistercians did. You're one of the last classes I'll be used to, you'll be able to use that reference with. Yeah. We share that moment at least. They would press olives with the, the water energy from the water wheel. They they became some of the most sophisticated metallurgists of the Middle Ages. They they would uh, hook up these bellows to the water wheel and create these crazy hot blast furnaces, and they would they perfected metallurgy, powering these uh, incredibly hot uh, uh, blast furnaces through the use of bellows. They became the leading iron smelters in medieval Europe. They have a proud history, and all because they were willing to 
uh, uh, sacrifice significantly as a community for some sort of greater um, spiritual vision. They used the water wheel to smash pulp for paper making. They smashed sugar cane for sugar extraction. They made power looms to create fabric weaving and other applications. They were geniuses. The Cistercians become, in fact, the best organized and most innovative factories in Europe. The equivalent, of course, they didn't have factories, but the, this was the, an early sign of industry as we would recognize it today. The Cistercian monks became effectively the engineers who designed the most technological uh, advanced applications of the times. It was an incredible story. I can see a lot of you nodding off. I think this is terribly exciting, but it is late in the day. Do you have any questions for me before we move on? I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Franciscans, too, and perhaps even the Dominicans before we close. Let me, um, let me give this idea to you, see if I can wake you up with this idea. <clears throat> a lot of us think, it's easy for us to think, that in the Middle Ages or at an earlier point in civilization's history, that it would have been more intuitive or somehow less of a sacrifice to be involved in a monastic community. It's easy for us to think that. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands, but I do want you to be self-reflective here. Um, it's easy for us to imagine, oh, this was a normal lifestyle or would have been more accepted by people's parents or would have somehow been uh, um, um, possible. Monasticism is not really possible today, we might think. Rubbish. Listen to this. Here is a formula that I want you to think about. Here's a formula how you and two other members of the same sex can invent a monastery with nothing at all. <laughs> this lesson is called How to Change the World with Three Matches and a Ball of String. Okay. <laughs> In other words, absolutely nothing. Here's what you do. Let's say that, that uh, we have a, um, a, um, somebody who's perhaps graduated with a high school diploma, perhaps who's not. Anyway, someone who technically is not received in the community as a skilled worker uh, who wants to become a monk. And they're able to find two other people who want to join him in this enterprise. They can do it. They can create a monastery. If someone works 25 hours a week <coughs> um, for 50 weeks of the year, uh, each week, they would be bringing in, actually, uh, $250, but let's say $200 because there are taxes and things like that. And if they did this times 50 weeks, then they would have an income individually of $10,000. Okay, $10,000 is uh, well under the poverty line and very difficult. The government can't imagine people living on that amount of money. But Let's say that there were two other people engaged in this type of lifestyle. So there's a group of three people with no, no uh, um, professional skills necessarily, and not even working full time, just working part time. But they could amass together a sum of thirty thousand dollars. Now, I would ask you: Can you imagine you and two other people living in a small apartment? Could you live a humble lifestyle on thirty thousand dollars? Could you? Some of you can't imagine that. Some of you can't imagine that. I can see it's borderline. All right. But um, if the community grows, you now you can always work a little more than 25 hours a week, but let's keep it at that rate. If, you, if the community grows, uh, you, let's say you have 10 of you grow, uh, living together, which would mean that if you're all at the same work schedule, you'd have $100,000, which would be enough to actually buy a house of some sort. It would be a very humble lifestyle, but it would be theoretically possible. Now, sooner or later, your community is going to snag somebody who has a professional position, so your income is going to double or whatever, what have you. If you can get uh, a computer programmer involved or you find a lawyer or somebody like that who wants to join your, your group, eventually that income begins to grow rapidly. Now, you're only working on the outside 25 hours a week, so what are you doing with the rest of your time? Well, hypothetically, you're involved, engaging that in some sort of community enterprise. Your community has a missional focus, whether it be benevolence to the poor or something like that. Or perhaps the ten of you decide to start actually a uh, an enterprise. So you start some sort of 
firm whereby you have a lot of extra time on your hands. Perhaps you give it to this company business. Perhaps the business starts to do well. Anyway, my, the only value of this thought experiment is that if people are actually willing to live that, a very primitive lifestyle that, like that, the, the monastic life could work today. What makes it difficult in any age is the spiritual vision. Why would people make the sacrifices in order to do this? And that, that was the hard part in the Middle Ages as well, or antiquity, casting that spiritual vision. Why would somebody give up and sacrifice for this lifestyle? But it's not the actual technicalities of the lifestyle that make it uh, uh, difficult. It's the spiritual vision. Why would people do this? Does that make sense to people? You follow that? All right. I was trying to wake you up by having you do some math. Did it work? Mm. Some of you don't like math either. All right. Uh, let's talk about the Franciscans anyway. Very quickly, because our time is running short. <clears throat> the Franciscans. So far, we've talked about the Augustinians. We've talked about the Benedictines. And we've talked about a number of forms of Benedictine monasticism through the Middle Ages. The Franciscans are an entirely new group. They're late runners. They, they come to the game late, we might say. Francis is born in the 1200s, or uh, 12th century, 1100s. He's born in 1181. So monasticism had been going on for uh, well over 500 years uh, in some form before Francis arrives in the scene. And yet Francis is remembered uh, by many as one of the most saintly uh, examples of the Christian life in all of history. Many people, when they're asked, who is it that after Christ lived the most, uh, a most Christian life or a most saintly life, many will think of Francis of Assisi. I like to think of Francis of Assisi as some sort of super saint. He's like, he's like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Mother Teresa all ruled into one incredible guy. He's a super saint. Francis of Assisi. He's born into this well-to-do family of good standing in the community. Francis' father, Pietro Bernardone, is a wealthy cloth merchant. His mother, Pica, had been born into a noble family as well. So he has uh, this luxurious upbringing. He's given the name Giovanni at his birth, uh, um, but then later he's called French, uh, Francesco, probably some speculate because his father did a lot of business in France, uh, uh, so he's called Francesco. Francis had some elementary education, but he never really took, uh, took to it. He was never a very serious student. He, his education was from the parish priests in Assisi, as would not have been uncommon. But he was not a very diligent student. He showed a much greater aptitude and desire for medieval partying. What did medieval partying look like? Well, frolicking at feasts, being the life and, and quite merry, uh, uh, being jovial, always stylishly dressed, spending money like water. That's what Francis was really good at during his young years. Because of his wealthy parents, he always had this supply of cash, and life seemed to always be very good for him. When Francis was 20 years old, he experienced something of a conversion. When he was 20 years old, Assisi, a city in northern Italy, uh, came into this skirmish against Perugia, another north Italian city. The Perugians and the Assisians went to battle. Uh, Francis went out for the Assisians. The Assisians lost. Francis spent a year in, in jail await, awaiting release. And this long period of time of reflection and an opportunity to, 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 to think, being pulled away from this luxurious lifestyle, got Francis thinking in a new direction. <clears throat> he was released. He came back to Assisi. He studied to become a knight. He had an apprenticeship to become a knight. He didn't really excel at that either. He was half-hearted at that. He uh, took up a business apprenticeship. Nothing really worked there either. He was searching. He was searching. He hadn't found himself or God. His friends start to notice this change in Assisi. Francis, what's going on? Are you thinking of marrying? Why are you so brood? Why are you so pensive and brooding? And Francis, according to tradition, responds, "Yes, I'm going to marry. I'm going to marry the most beautiful woman of all, 
Lady Poverty. Hmm. He spends considerable time and increasing amounts of time in prayer, solitude. He's trying to understand this call on his life. One day, while riding his horse across the fields of northern Italy, he encounters a leper. And the story runs that Francis' first impulse was to run away, to get away from this diseased man as fast as possible. But instead, with this new way of thinking that's been coming over him, he decides to dismount, uh, give the, the beggar his... Uh, um, uh, uh, he embraces the man, he embraces the man, gives him all his money, and takes off again. Francis is changing. Something is taking place in his heart and mind. He's spending time praying before the crucifix of the chapel of St. Damien, and he thinks he hears a voice telling him, Francis, go and support the church which is falling down. And even today, if you go to that chapel, you'll find a statue in front of it of, of, uh, of St. Francis there holding up his hands, and if you look at it rightly, it looks like he's holding up the church behind him. Francis thought that his call, this divine uh, call from God, was to go and rebuild the church. So... He has access to wealth. He goes back to his father's factory, gathers up a whole lot of very expensive cloth, takes it out to uh, the well-to-do market in the city, sells all the cloth, sells the horse too, brings that cash that he made from this deal back and gives it to the parish priest at, at St. Damien to repair this, this uh, decrepit church building. The priest at St. Damien will have nothing to do with it because he's heard about how Francis raised this money and he knows that uh, Francis' father, who is a very hard businessman, is going to have his life for this. So he says, no, 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 absolutely not. I won't take that money. When, um, when his father, Francis' father, hears about all of his, uh, a lot of these goods being sold and then the money trying to be given away, his father's terribly angry. Uh, Francis knows that his father is going to be terribly, terribly anger, angry, and so Francis goes away and fasts in this cave for a month near St. Damien's uh, church. He thinks that's probably long enough for his dad not to be terribly angry at me. He comes back. He's starting to look emaciated, filthy. People are starting to wonder about Francis' sanity. Uh, but the time was not sufficient for Francis' father to have eased up. His father has Francis beaten, locked in the cellar, and so on. Eventually, Francis escapes quite ticked with his dad. They go to court because his father's trying to disown him. His father, his father probably thinks that Francis has gone mad, or at least he, do, he no longer understands his son at all, so he's trying to make sure that legally his son will not have authority over his estate. So that's the, the sympathetic reading. But from Francis' point of view, his father's disowning him. He's had enough. Done. You're done, son. You're no longer my son. So in court, Francis uh, strips completely nude hands his clothes back to his father and says, from now on I call out to our father who is in heaven. It was cold outside. Francis goes to a monastery. Life is changing very, very rapidly. February the 24th, 1208, Francis is attending a service at St. Mary of the Angels Church and a scripture reading is read in, the, in which the gospel teaching is given that the disciples are not to take two coats or walking sticks or a purse, and Francis takes this as his life calling. He's actually going to do what the rest of Christians think must have been a theological joke. He's going to actually live out Jesus' teaching about how to be a disciple. In Assisi, there's a change of heart going on. People who knew Francis and had seen this radical transformation of this well-to-do young man started to think that there might be something to his change. Maybe he's not just crazy. And a number, remember he was this very jovial chap, he had a lot of friends. Uh, a, a number of these people, these, these uh, sons of wealthy merchants too and so on, these people of influence and wealth, decide that they're actually going to follow a, a Francis of Assisi. So, Eventually, we have the founding of this Friars Minor. Friars, of course, being uh, a medieval word for brother. You can recognize it in the French or Latin, too. It's the, the Little Brothers, the Friars Minor. This is this group that we now know as the Franciscans. Francis eventually wrote them up a rule. He decided to actually structure the life. Gives them a brief, uh, um, the, the rule is brief and allows excuse me, and follows the basic principles that Jesus gave to his disciples when he sent them out on preaching tours. 
The, Fra the Franciscans are a mendicant order. Mendicant. Can any of you tell me what mendicant means? What's a mendicant order? It means, to cut through the fat, it's a begging order. You remember what the Benedictines followed. Uh, uh, ora et labora, pray and work labora, excuse me. The Franciscans were a mendicant order. They had, they had seen for hundreds of years how the Benedictine lifestyle actually generated tremendous wealth and then lent itself to spiritual abuse at some point, as, as power tends to do. And the Franciscans thought that they were going to escape all this by being a begging order, because that would necessarily keep them humble. In our terms today, we would think of it as a faith mission. It was a, uh, the, the, the friars minor lived from the charity of others. It was a begging order, if you wish. They existed by uh, requesting donations from others. Good. Uh, the Franciscans, as we look at some of the changes then that are taking place in the late Middle Ages, uh, this is this is during some of the time of the the Crusades. The Crusades are just starting to get going uh, during this period, and it's um, it's no surprise that the Franciscans along with the Dominicans actually do especially well during this period. Well, the institutional church is uh, demonstrating its um, uh, solidarity uh, with political endeavors and specifically military endeavors, uh, the military endeavors of the Crusades. The Franciscans were seeking a disempowered state, uh, seeking specifically to have this humble lifestyle, and they were constructing it. Uh, according to this, these mendicant principles. Let me just say a word about the Dominicans as well. The Dominicans, St. Dominic was born in 1170 and lived to about 1221. St. Dominic was born in Spain and he studied theology there. Uh, after studies, he joined an Augustinian monastery. The Dominicans, the order of the friars of St. Dominic, he founded and they were founded to preach the gospel. That was the mission for the Dominicans. In fact, if you have ever met a Dominican or seen their name spelled, you'll see OP at the end of their name. Do you know what OP stands for? Order of Preachers. They're the Dominicans. It was, it was around this time that St. Dominic witnessed Pope Innocent III persecuting the Albigensians. You know, what was all that about? The Albigensians we won't get into, but it was a Christian sect sort of a revival of Manichaeism, if you remember from way back when in this class. But anyway, it was a, it was a heretical group of Christians, and the, the Vatican decides to suppress this heretical group by having a crusade against them. It was a crusade against the Albigensians. Dominic witnessed this and concluded, you're never going to win back heretics by crusading efforts. That's never going to win people back to the truth. What was it that won them to the heresy? Well, in fact, it was purity of life. It was spirituality that won them uh, to this outside group. It will have to be true spirituality that wins them back, not military might. Listen to what St. Dominic writes. He writes, It is not by the display of power and pomp, cavalcades of retineers and richly housed horses, or by gorgeous apparel, that the heretics win proselytes. It is by zealous preaching, by apostolic humility, by austerity, by seeming it is true, but by seeming holiness. Zeal must be met by zeal, humility by humility, false sanctity by real sanctity. Preaching falsehood must be met by preaching the truth. That was Dominic's uh, plan for how to reach the world, and specifically how to reach these Christian heretics, or how to reach the Muslims of the Middle East as well. His goal was not through crusading efforts, but by ordering, uh, by founding a order of monks. He start, St. Dominic starts this order uh, with the explicit purpose for evangelism. And the, the Dominicans, of course, you know their name today. They're still thriving uh, today as well. They were phenomenally successful. Albertus Magnus, the teacher of, of uh, 
um, Thomas Aquinas and Thomas Aquinas himself were both Dominicans. These Dominicans take on, uh, uh, produce some of the most brilliant theologians of the Middle Ages as well. All right, scholars, I'm not going to launch into a lecture on medieval exegesis with our last five minutes, but let's take a moment or two just to quickly reflect, gather up any questions that you might have. There's, uh, is there a quiz? Oh, yes, there's a quiz. So whip out your, your uh, uh, computers as we take those as well. But let me take one or two questions if you have those as well. Josh, go ahead, please. Good. Josh's question is, what, what were the views of salvation in these monastic communities? Good. No, to, to, to uh, negate specifically the question that you asked there, no, the monks didn't believe that you had to be uh, in, a in a monastery to be saved. So they understood that salvation was in the broader church as well. However, they didn't perceive themselves as something of an elite force. They did understand... Um, that those who wanted to be truly sold out Christians would probably lead this type of lifestyle. They did understand that worldliness had crept into the broader church, affecting both institutional power structures and family life and all everything else. So there was this there was this psychological divide between the the uh, uh, the uh, ordered priests and the, quote, secular clergy. We use that word secular in a very different way, but if you read about medieval secular priests, what are we talking about? We're talking about non-monastic priests, those who are priests with the institutional Roman Catholic Church, but not priests. So there was this strong divide there, uh, but no, they didn't understand, they didn't assume that you couldn't be a Christian unless you were a monk. Any other questions? Any other questions? Go ahead, Josh. Good, let me check. 1170 to 1221, I think, yes. 1170 to 1221. Good, any other questions? Okay. Why don't we take that quiz and be done then? Great, Palmer, over to you. Is everybody ready for the first quiz? and the last quiz of the semester. Can you raise your hand if you're not ready to take it on Blackboard? So quite a few, okay. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay, if by this point you have not been able to get into the quiz, just go ahead and write down your answers and I'll leave it open. Question one. At what point of his life did St. Augustine compile his monastic rule? A. He did not. It actually belongs to his mother Monica, who wrote it before he was born. B. Its composition was concurrent with that of City of God. C. Immediately after his baptism. D. He did not. It was created long after his death by monks using his writings. Or E. Just before his death. Question 2. Which of the following rules does not belong to the monastic rule of St. Augustine? A. Congregate for corporate prayer 11 times per day. B. Dress modestly. C. Do not be proud. D. Property is common to all. Or E. Obey the prioress. Question 3. 
According to the lecture, what has proven to be the most influential monastic rule in Western monasticism? Is it A, the rule of St. Augustine, B, the rule of St. Ambrose, C, the rule of St. Basil, D, the rule of St. Francis, or E, the rule of St. Benedict? Question four. Ora et labora, pray and work, is the motto of which monastic group? A, the Augustinians, B, the Cistercians, C, the Franciscans, D, the Cluniacs, or E, the Benedictines? And question five, who founded the Franciscan order and when was he born? A, Francis Xavier in 1506 AD, B, Augustine in 354 AD, C, Benedict of Nursia in 480 AD, D, Francis of Assisi in 1181 AD, or E, Dominic in 1170 AD. And that is the final quiz question of the semester. Thank you all for being a great class. I really, really enjoyed working with you. I hope many of you will uh, come back for the next semester in CWC2. I'm really looking forward to that class as well. My thanks to Tim Wellings and Palmer Bandy for faithfully supporting us in our efforts. And thanks again to you. We'll see you uh, uh, later this break and, and maybe next semester. Good. An email will come out letting you know when it's open. Hopefully it'll be open before exam week, but certainly throughout the entirety of exam week. Thanks.